Jacob. Awesome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for yet again another in a series. I think we're at number seven now uh, of webinars called Freshly Certified. Today, we're going to have a, spe a very special focus um, on our educators for an educator edition. Um, so for those who don't know who I am, my name is Amanda Bolte. I am the Director of Creative and Brands at Motif Labs. I'm a serial freelancer. I'm a mentor and designer. I'm a certified RDD. I currently serve um, on the certification advice on the certification committee, as well as on the board of directors. I am a certification present, presentation reviewer. So I'm one of the many faces that you'll see throughout the process when you go through to become a certified RTD. Um, if you have any questions for our presenter today, presenters today, please use the chat in the control panel. We'll hold all questions until the panelists are done. So be able to, so they're able to have their chance to present. Um, so, but feel free to uh, to keep chatting. Um, so today's webinar is, just, is discussing RGD certified a certification experience, especially around educators, but mainly focused around the case study development and presentation. Our panel of recently certified RGDs, educator RGDs, um, are going to break down their, their case studies, why they choose chose them, the process of putting them together, gathering the assets, the results, and how they chose to present it. Um, but first, let me talk a little bit more about those who are interested in the RGD in general and overall certification process. And let me just do a little bit of a general introduction. So for those who don't know, um, the RGD is uh, are made up of members of about 4,000 and growing uh, very rapidly of like-minded professionals, including firm owners, freelancers, managers, educators, like these two lovely ladies, and uh, students with access to professional development, resources, and a vibrant exchange of information. Through RGD, Canadians, Canadian designers exchange ideas, ideas, educate and inspire, set professional standards, and build a strong supportive community dedicated to advocating for the value of design. If you want any more information on RGD, its benefits, uh, and the resources available for members, or the larger design community events, please visit our website at rgd.ca. So let's talk about today. So today we're talking about certification. So becoming an RGD is broken down to four steps. Filling out the application to see if you're eligible, taking an online test, a virtual online portfolio review, and then the presentations of your uh, presentations from the RGD. But today, our focus is on the fun part, in my opinion, the virtual online portfolio review. This is where designers get to be designers. Portfolio, our portfolios are presented over 30 minutes to three senior design practitioners serving as RGD reviewers, like me. Can, candidates present the same six pieces submitted as part of the RGD certification application. During the review, you are all to, sp to speak to uh, to all of the case studies within the 30 minutes without going to while going into depth with one of those six pieces. Keep in mind for the art uh, for the educator um, application, the the uh, the re requirements are a little bit different. Um, so please reach out if you're interested in becoming an art educator, um, educator applicant, and we'll be able to walk you through that process more in detail. Um, so, and, and if you want to learn any more any in depth about the certification. There's also a free monthly webinar that goes into depth on the entire process and recordings are available on the RGD website. Please just please reach out to Heidi Avery um, at rgd.ca. So I'm going to introduce our first candidate today, our first uh, freshly certified RGD today, Bianca Di Petro. I hope I said that right, Bianca. Uh, Bianca is a designer, educator, and artist who is interested in discovering meaningful, meaningful work and finding ways to uncover true a true personal impact. Previously a full-time educator, but currently as she is combining her passions for design and food as a creative lead on the brand team for Hello Fresh Canada. I'm a big fan. Bianca is a passionate thrifter and a roller skate and roller skater living out of uh, living and working out of Hamilton, Ontario. Bianca, you're awesome. I can't wait to hear more. <laughs> All right. 
Let me just get set up here. Okay, here we go. So um, thank you, Amanda, for that great intro. Um, today, I will be talking about a charrette that I attended in Kia, Denmark in 2018. Um, and this is my educator's case study that I decided to go through today with, with all of you. Um, and basically, it's an international design charrette challenge. Um, this specific year in 2018, uh, the theme was connecting communities. I have a little slide about myself, but Amanda already did the, the, uh, the job of introducing. Um, one thing I did want to add is I have, I did, I was an educator for six years at Humber, um, and now I am in a full-time creative lead role, but I actually still teach part-time, so I'm still actually quite involved um, in the education academia space. Um, and still exploring, you know, different ways of educating and engaging with my students. So I just wanted to add that. Um, but nice to uh, meet everybody. Um, so I'm going to start off with talking about the charrette um, and giving a bit of context around uh, what it is, um, why it's appropriate for a case study um, in terms of a educator's application to the RGD. Um, and things like that. So a charrette, if you don't know, um, is an intensive collaborative process that brings together students, community members, and professionals to develop innovative solutions for complex issues. Um, it's done in sort of a sprint scenario over a short period uh, of time um, that involves discussion, brainstorming, consultations, team, team meetings, all kinds of um, different collaboration techniques around a central theme. This specific charrette that I attended in 2018 um, at Kia University in Denmark um, had 80 students from around the world gather for a week in Copenhagen with the help of 30 expert advisors. So you can see uh, the photo there of us gathering in one of the main spaces that we had access to. Um, the 2018 charrette um, uh, was in, uh, sorry, immersed students in the local Norvest um, organizations to see how they could connect communities together in an inclusive design approach. So because of the format of a charrette, um, the groups are free to create a solution that would work based on the theme, connecting communities, but also based on the problem or the challenge that they were given by their collaborating organizations. So the whole point is there's this overarching theme um, and then uh, the students actually work with an organization on that theme with a specific challenge. So there's a couple different components in play. Um, they learn about service design um, to identify the best solution uh, for their said problem uh, for that week. Um, and then they, at the heart of what the Kia Charette is, is harnessing the knowledge and the creativity of a diverse group. So um, I picked this specific case study because, you know, it, it does incorporate the idea of learning, but everybody's learning. Everybody's bringing something to contribute to the Charette because the students were a diverse group of students from various parts around the world, different backgrounds, different experiences but also actually different disciplines. So for example, you know, the group that I was advising on had digital marketing, architecture, design, um, urban design, all kinds of different aspects um, that could contribute to uh, the group. So you had the opportunity to collaborate with people you have not collaborated with before. My role uh, in the charrette was that of an advisor. So at the time I was teaching at Humber full time, um, advisors were assigned to a specific group. Um, and our role was to really guide them through this process, this challenge and the execution of their group's solution. Um, and basically they were, they were tasked to present a feasible design solution for the assigned participating organization. So again, or emerging theme, different organizations partnering with Kia and then students were paired with those organizations. Um, 
And as you can imagine, because we have an overarching theme, we have a variety of different students, variety of different advisors from different disciplines as well. You get these very varied executions or um, sort of ways of the solution being uh, put together for each group. So the method, um, like any sort of good um, project in a class or brief in any sort of creative uh, uh, project, um, comes with a great brief. So Kia uh, is well known. I think they've been doing this for over 10 years. Uh, every year they do the Kia Charette International Design Workshop. So they brief, they brief the students, they brief the advisors, uh, we're given the context of the project um, and all that is entailed in the theme and sort of the execution. Um, with this specific Charette, uh, it was how can help can, how can design help create enduring connections between people and their immediate surroundings defined within the boundaries of Norvest, um, an exceedingly diverse urban di district within Copenhagen. Um, the charrette invited students to draw, like I said, on their professional academic experiences uh, to uh, basically meet the challenge of the partnering organization and create an inclusive design solution um, with a, for a section of Copenhagen that struggles with limited social and economic resources. So the participating organizations are listed there. Um, and yeah, each, each group was, uh, so the, the students were divided into groups and multiple groups were assigned to each organization. So there was multiple groups working on each of these participating organizations. Um, and then this is just the materials that was given to both the students and the advisors to give context to how this was going to run. Uh, again, it's a very short sprint type format, um, and it was very structured. So the students knew when they had time to work, students knew when they had time to connect with their advisors, they know when presentations were being held. Um, when content was being delivered, social activities to get them immersed in the Denmark uh, Copenhagen culture of, um, uh, of the city um, and all that great, that great stuff. So um, this was all put together. So there was really no confusion on um, what was happening and when it was happening. This is a space. Um, so uh, Kia gave us a nice space to set up sort of where the students could connect. Uh, advisors could do their advising. They could keep their materials and their process and their whatever they were working on in this space. They had the opportunity to cross pollinate with other groups. Um, and really just as, as good design uh, happens in collaborative spaces, this was a really, really dynamic um, opportunity for the students to really just engage with one another and learn a lot. Um, again, just from the top view, um, you know, they were just working in groups and this is an opportunity again to exchange ideas and really work through their problem. Um, so uh, students really uh, had the opportunity also to uh, have access to, to, to materials. So um, they had the opportunity to build prototypes, actually build things, test things, depending on what their solution was, which was really great. Um, again, another reason I chose this was to show that like, these types of scenarios where, you know, education is really uh, exploring the space of, you know, collaboration, cross-pollination uh, cross and, and building things and prototyping things and testing things um, is really, really a great opportunity for students. And I think the future, if not now, like we're doing it now, but even more so will be uh, how we sort of conduct courses and conduct classes in the future. Um, so to help the groups reach their best solution, um, they had knowledgeable and talented people intersect in the week. So this is what I'm talking about. You know, we had individuals who were experts in service design present. 
um, as well as organizations that really knew the culture of the, the section of Copenhagen that the students were focusing on. So we had presentations in that regard as well. Um, students were uh, introduced to the history, history of Norbro uh, and Norvest um, by key residents. Um, they were immersed in Danish culture. Uh, they had folk dancing classes. So it was a very fun, engaging experience. Um, students attended presentations, like I said, on service design, Norvest culture, culture and music, concept development, and all kinds of different things to sort of give a foundational uh, set of, of knowledge uh, since students were coming from a variety of uh, backgrounds. And us, the advisors, the, the educators coming from different parts of the world, um, were there to guide the students along the way. So we were, we were present at presentations. We were guiding them through uh, prompting questions, um, prompting them to you know, dig deeper into their problem and probe them into certain directions of exploring new, new concepts. Um, and just engaging with one another, engaging with the content. Um, again, just more photos of the actual event and these things that the students were actually putting together. They had notes upon notes and post-its and, and everything was going on over the, the five days that we, that we did this charrette. Um, and as mentioned, we were encouraged to go off-site. So there were off-site presentations at the actual participating organization space, whatever that space may be, if it was an office, if it was a concert hall, if it was the students were encouraged and uh, explored the city um, in that regard as well. So process. Um, so uh, because this is a charrette and um, again, this, the diversity of the students that were attending um, was was amazing. Like it was it was awesome to be able to work with students who were you know from different countries and things like that. So inclusive design was a theoretical approach that was uh, the basis of the charrette, and it's a practice based approach um, that looks at creating sustainable social spaces where the focus is the interaction between design objects and human users. Um, the students were also encouraged to uh, explore radical empathy, um, looking at how students can incorporate new lines of connection um, across social and cultural groupings um, within the city to push the boundaries of what this idea of connecting communities means. So again, the overarching, overarching theme of um, the charrette. This is uh, photos of the advising, the prototyping, as well as the presentations uh, that was put on um, throughout the week. More advising. So again, uh, specifically why I chose this case study was because it was really the most, uh, the best example of how true collaboration and uh, different disciplines come together to really uh, solve a complex issue, an issue that you might not fully understand, but you explore and learn as you go. Um, and the results. So um, the results of the charrette was a presentation by each group. Um, and that presentation was to be a certain length, um, not, not, no longer, I believe, than 10 minutes. Um, and each, each group presented the, the challenge, the participating organization, and their solution. Um, and here's some photos of the students presenting their solutions to uh, the Connecting Communities uh, uh, theme challenge. And so the results were varied as uh, participating students. So again, you know, you put together a variety of students from different, different backgrounds, different disciplines, um, different countries with different cultural experiences. Um, and we basically got like a whole bunch of different concepts that included giant building blocks. So you saw that photo of the, what looked like a large piece of Lego, um, ever-changing public message boards greenhouse cafes, multicultural food trucks, and much more. So the solutions, again, were varied because of the students' um, expertise and what they were bringing to the conversation, but also because the partnering organization had a different 
problem, um, depending on what organization each student was paired with. Um, the concepts um, were judged by a jury um, and then a uh, winner is awarded as the best project um, because their idea was involved all the residents in a simple, cost-free, and democratic way. Um, so the objectives of the charrette were to address the partnering organization's challenge. Um, and every group did this in a su successful way. Um, there was no solutions that were not feasible, um, but the best project was just one that sort of hit all the key, um, key uh, I guess, criteria for uh, the partnering organization and what they considered a feasible project. Each organization did respond with positive feedback, ensuring that all ideas could be executed or parts of them could be rolled out in some, in some manner. Um, so I have a short, a short video. Um, this is actually from the 2018 Charette. So this is students sort of talking about their experience um, and what they really got out of um, the charrette. So I'm just gonna play this. I'm gonna have to exit out because. We are learning a lot from for the city and from the city and about different cultures. And we've uh, figured out a good system of sharing ideas and using each other's skills. I think it's a very positive thing uh, to experience a viewpoint that isn't your own. Our project's about um, building a network between people, families and communities um, and connecting these individuals to other support networks within Copenhagen. We're working with something I think that everybody knows here, especially in Denmark, it's Lego. We are developing a food truck that can bridge the gap between immigrants coming to Denmark as well as the community that's already living in Denmark. And we're placing those different cultures in a network based on several places which are unused or completely abandoned. So the idea is that we push the children and somehow that could bring the adults or their parents together to interact more into something that could be formed as, that could be a market space formed by these building blocks. So the market space would function if they want to sell something from their culture like food or sell something they don't use and just that interaction could help them to empower that neighborhood. Uh, the charrette, in a few words, uh, I would probably say teamwork, networking, fun, inclusive, multicultural, challenging, a learning experience, collaboration, and just cultured, I guess. Don't lose your s when building an on. There we go. <laughs> that's just, just a short video of, um, like I said, the experience of 20, that's from 2018. They do sort of a recap uh, every year on the charrette. Um, this is just a photo that I wanted to show of, um, they brought out the sort of this black box at the end. Um, and had students write on the box what they felt like they had learned from the Kia Shred or what it was or what it meant to them, which I thought was a really great experience for sort of wrapping up the event um, to uh, have the students reflect on it and uh, really think about uh, what it meant to them to participate. So, and then finally, I wanna talk a little bit about ethics. Um, so, Attending the charrette was completely voluntary. Um, the way it worked at my institution, uh, Humber College, was that uh, it was voluntary. This, the uh, institution provided some funding for the students to actually go and participate in the charrette. Um, so it didn't cost them a full cost. It would if they would have 
done this on their own. Um, and then some schools would award sort of co-op hours or credits for participation. So um, in specific for Humber, we gave credits for co-op opportunity. Um, so that's the students were getting some sort of sort of kickback in terms of completing their co-op hours. Um, and the students were supported by advisors. So, you know, in industry professionals, it was an academic experience. It was something that they learned a tremendous amount throughout the, the week. Um, the experience was educational, but the, really the, the highlight of it is it's also a cultural experience for the students. They're experiencing a new country. They're collaborating with new individuals, new educators, advisors, exploring a new city. Um, there are so many aspects to this that are quite um, diverse that you don't really get in your uh, in the regular classroom scenario. Um, and then, you know, developing soft skills where you're actually collaborating with people who and that are not technically from your discipline um, is really something that uh, is a benefit. Um, and then the students were evaluated based on criteria and the jury was chosen to evaluate based on that criteria um, and a winner was given based on that criteria. Um, so this is a jury selecting the winner of the 2018 charrette. Um, and therefore, um, I think this specific uh, educator's case study um, really hits on um, the ethics 9.1.2, 9.1.4, and 9.1 or 9.2.2. I will strive to prepare my students for the realities of the graphic communication design field. I will not unfairly exploit students for my own private business interests, and I will develop assignments that allow students to develop projects in public good, projects that serve society, and projects that uh, help improve human experience. Um, specifically, the last one I think resonates really well here um, because, uh, again, as design changes and the sort of the academia space changes, um, the way we sort of do these collaborative projects will also be changing. Um, and then I just wanted to just highlight on another note that this uh, whole charrette, this whole production that they do every year that falls in October, I believe it is. Um, yeah, October 10th to 15th was completely executed remotely during the pandemic. So students were selected from different countries. They logged on remotely. Time, time, time differences were a challenge, but it was actually quite a successful experience to, uh, fully remote during the pandemic, which I was able to also advise on. So in conclusion, I just want to uh, sort of uh, close this out by saying, Charrettes are our modern day cultural cross-disciplinary collaborative and educational experience for students in the ac academic space. Um, and they really allow the students to get this really immersive experience that they don't get in the classroom alone. Um, obviously this, the basis of their skills develop there, but these are the, this case study and this, these types of experiences are what students really like learn a ton from. Um, and I know it's not always feasible for everybody, but when the opportunity arises, it's a really beneficial experience for students. And that's the case study. So that's the case study I presented. Um, I hope the structure really helps understand how I sort of divided things out um, and really sort of documented the whole, the whole experience. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Awesome, Bianca. I was at, that's amazing. Like, as a student to be able to join wow. into one of those charrettes would have literally blown my mind. Um, like, that would have been so much fun. Um, are they going to be doing it? Uh, are they? Do they have plans on going back um, in person, like in twenty twenty two, and in the future? Um, yes. So I believe the last one in October of twenty twenty one was a hybrid. So some people were actually doing it remote because, you know, we were still in this, this spot where things weren't yeah. really back to normal, but there were some people who were on site. So they did a hybrid version as well. It's, quite it's kind of, it's, 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 I, I'm excited about the in back to in-person thing. I don't know if there's something tangible that you get from like sharing a piece of paper or riffing off another idea. Like I think our virtual space is given 
it's opened up way more possibilities that we never had there before. Like as far as like maybe more people that weren't able to attend that, you know, they didn't have to worry about the, like the, the tie, like the airfare or like any of the costs put toward it. So they put into it, but yeah. something tangible about writing on a whiteboard together, you know oh, what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. But now, <laughs> I have, uh, I have an unhealthy yeah. amount of post-it notes in my possession. I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> I think I've banned myself from going to Staples. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, excellent. No, thank you very much. I'm sure that there may be some questions on that one, but, um, and I, I'll have some questions for both of you at the end, but uh, thanks so much. No problem. Awesome. So next up, um, just in the essence of time, because I want to make sure that these uh, wonderful uh, design women get to speak today. We have Diana Varma. Diana is uh, RGD. Diana is an award-winning Toronto-based university lecturer by day and an avid podcaster by night, where she helps students connect their technical left brains and creative right brains and entrepreneurial hearts for fulfilling careers in the creative industries. She appreciates memes from The Office and Miss Frizzle. You're a woman after my own heart. Um, and the, the magic school bus frame is her teaching idol. I love it. Uh, Diana, I can't wait to hear more. Thank you so much for that introduction, Amanda. And hi, everybody. So I am Diana, and I'm going to show you, let me pull this up right now, I'm going to share my screen with you. I became certified in January 2021. So it was kind of in the middle of the pandemic and that's when I my certification happened. So the six pieces that I ended up showing or including as part of this portfolio um, interview review, my master's thesis, which was all about craft beer and packaging, I included online course development that I had been working on. I included uh, kind of a faculty advisor role for students that I had taken on. I included a uh, specific project that I built out for one of my courses that I was particularly proud of. Uh, I included my work writing for an industry magazine. And finally, I included my podcast. And that's kind of what I want to share with you today, because I think it is perhaps the most unconventional of the list for an educator, but it was really one that I felt I could speak to passionately and share and, and hopefully become certified, So, which happened. So that's, that's always good. So I am gonna to focus today on my podcast um, kind of re review or project that I, I shared with reviewers. And uh, I will say though, it was a bit of an unusual situation. So I was one of the very first to apply through the new educator application form. So I went through all of that. However, I still presented my information based on the design practitioners format. So it's kind of this weird hybrid thing I did. So all is to say that it would look a little bit different if I were to do it again today, but I want to share with you what I have. And I've also put together some kind of tips and tricks and things that I would recommend going forward. So let me just jump right now to that entry. Uh, which is this podcast. So I had it broken down into context. Uh, which is this. So I think it makes the most sense just and based on time, um, I'm going to kind of give you a high level overview of what I shared with reviewers and then I'll get into my, my tips and tricks. So what I shared with reviewers was this. So uh, basically my podcast was launched in late 2019 as a passion project. It's called Talk Paper Scissors. And now it's really a platform that I use to explore interesting topics in the world of graphic communications. Uh, my goal is really with this podcast to push the boundaries of what is thought possible in graphic communications education. And really, I chose this specific case study or project because I think it's a really good example of both my creative and my technical skills showcased in one place. And so when I presented this, the episodes I had so far focused on were things like the history of print, the intricacies of typography and the making of books. And I really took this platform that was a passion project. And in fall 2020, when I was kind of challenged with remote virtual learning, I used the podcast as a platform to deliver content to my second year typography class asynchronously in lieu of formal lectures. So I scrapped lectures. 
I recorded a whole pile of episodes throughout the summer, and then students could listen and walk and, and kind of absorb the content in a different way rather than either reading or attending Zoom classes, because I know people were gonna get Zoomed out. So I was just experimenting with a delivery method in teaching. So I spent a lot of time thinking about kind of what the visual brand would look like for this podcast, as well as topics I could cover. So uh, again, I used it kind of um, in maybe a non traditional way in the world of teaching. And it was, um, yeah, it, it's, it was just a really kind of fun way to deliver content. So I had uh, a number of, or I still do have a number of kind of mini series planned for 2022 uh, and beyond, all about digital publishing, children's book design, one about lipstick and tattoos. So kind of the art and science of makeup and tattooing. So it's really kind of, it, it's, everything sits under the umbrella of creativity in graphic communications. And in terms of what we'll call a solution here, so I think the problem, and I'm going to focus on this problem here, um, specifically in regards to my intro to typography course that I used this podcast for uh, to deliver content in lieu of those traditional lectures. I knew that Zoom fatigue and lots of reading were going to be challenges that semester. So I kind of wanted to proactively move students away from their computers, encourage them to put down the screens and take a walk while listening or fold some laundry or do whatever they needed to do to break up the day. And so the problem really here was how to engage students about a visual topic using a non-visual medium. So that was really the, the problem. And the solution that I came to were a few different ways. So I provided lots of stories that could be easily imagined. So for example, I actually created an entire kid's story, a kid's book uh, called The Letter Braid to help students learn about the anatomy of type in kind of a cheeky and memorable way. Uh, what I also did is I provided visuals through other means to support the podcast. So I created a website and there were show notes that were available with each episode. And I actually used a lot of kind of heavily scripted um, text. So I wrote a lot of it out in advance, but what that afforded me was to include that also as part of the show notes. So if students really were not auditory learners, they really didn't listen uh, or couldn't listen well and absorb the material, they could actually go back and read through the material as well. So that was kind of uh, something I, I added. And then one other thing that I did, which was kind of fun, is there were three tests in the course. And before each one, I had kind of a live radio contest or like pub quiz style show where students acted as the live studio audience. So I had a whole bunch of students, like 30, 40 students on a Friday night attend this session. And through polling and through me kind of asking questions and narrating, um, they kind of got to answer these, these trivia questions, as it were, that prepped them for the test. And it was really a huge hit. I mean, who doesn't like answering <laughs> like a radio quiz show? You're at home or you're in the car and you're trying to guess along with the answers. That's kind of what I wanted to do and what I was able to do in this audio format. All right, and then ultimately the results. So I had some really good traction with my podcast and I have listeners kind of um, all over the world. And I think that speaks to the nature of where students were displaced and kind of where they, they have been hanging out for the past two years. But I think the podcasting format is so great because it is accessible in all of those spaces. I went back and forth a lot as to do I release this only through our um, desire to learn our D2L kind of course shells so it's only accessible there. Or do I launch it out more broadly to the world, whereby students can download an episode through Apple podcasts or Spotify and then. Uh, take that kind of offline so they could download the episode onto their phone and and go with it uh, wherever they were whether they had internet or not so i ultimately decided for the latter option and it was i think a really good decision so there were some really meaningful bits of feedback students reached out to me directly to say that they just they wanted to thank me for kind of making theory fun and trying this new engagement technique so i don't think it was um i think it was a success. I think there's always room for improvement with anything new that we try, but I was really happy with the feedback that I received from students.
Yeah, and so that's kind of what what the results were for me. Um, the, the last little piece here I will say is that as part of my work developing these podcast episodes, um, I was featured in a, a Toronto Metropolitan University initiative called Inspired Teaching. And so I was interviewed about creating my podcast, using it as an alternative lecture format. And it was just um, a really great way to capture what I had done and share it with others. Because although there can be a learning curve to creating kind of audio content like this, it, there doesn't have to be this huge production value. There's still uh, a lot to be gained and a lot of really great stuff to share with students, even if it's kind of a, a more DIY approach. So I just I wanted to share that with with the university and educators more broadly, because I think there is so much value in getting students away from their screens and learning in a different format. So all is to say that's kind of what I shared with the uh, with the, the panel. What I will say, though, here are some tips. I was thinking about it earlier today, and I jotted down some ideas of if I were to do this again, what would I do the same? What would I do differently? So definitely what I would continue to do and what I really tried to pull in uh, to all of my examples, all six, were metrics. So whenever possible, taking an abstract idea or a scenario and making it relatable through numbers, I think is very, very helpful. So for my podcast, I shared with, uh, with reviewers, I shared how many downloads I had, how many episodes there were, uh, that type of thing. But other educational metrics you could include are things like the number of students who are enrolled in your courses, the number of courses you've taught, quantitative and qualitative feedback about a project or course. And kind of grouped in with this, I would also um, encourage you to include insights about what you learned, what, again, you would keep the same for next time, what you would change if you were to do it again. Another piece of advice, another slice of advice would be to create to the rubric. I think as educators, uh, we are more finely attuned than probably anyone else out there as to how to interpret and work with a grading rubric. So remember that you're evaluated on context, method, and results. 30% of the grading scale each are uh, context, method, and results. And then ethics is that 10% at the end. So context is uh, just kind of as a, as a high level overview is like, can you speak to uh, what you are talking about professionally, knowledgeably, and kind of clearly. Method, is it tailored to your audience? What insights were gained? Have you demonstrated professional expertise through this project? Results, does what you're showing solve the design problem or the educational problem that is at hand? And then finally, ethics. So aligning to, does this project align to ethical design practice? And in RDD's Code of Ethics, Section 9, right at the end, is the ones that apply to educators. And Bianca um, <clears throat> identified in her, her presentation exactly that, which, which kind of uh, specific pieces, there are six rules and six best practices, so which ones apply to this project. And if I were doing it again, this was not part of the grading criteria when I did it, but if I were to do it again and had to include this, I think I would almost create a table that has the six rules and six best practices and literally have like check, check, check this specific project or case study includes these, uh, however many of the six rules and six best practices and or make a note as to how I demonstrated it during the project. My next slice is to make it visual, duh, right? We know our audience is design practitioners, senior design practitioners. So any way that you can pull in visuals and bring uh, the visuals to life on screen, I think will make a greater impact. And uh, the final two pieces here are, uh, for me, this is not, I would say this is personal preference or something I tried to do that I think I'm really kind of proud of, but it's not certainly a requirement, but it's just to demonstrate range. So if you are able to show a variety of different projects, I think it's it's great for the panel to see that not only do I uh, host this podcast that I kind of dreamed up on mat leave and, and turned into an educational teaching tool, but also my master's thesis. Although I did not graduate from a design specific program in my master's degree, I really chose to focus on the world of type and semiotics and design 
as part of that master's thesis. Uh, then talking about my advisory role with students and in that in that faculty advisor um, capacity. So I think just if you can show that you are a well rounded educator, I think subconsciously that goes a long way to demonstrating just kind of your um, your capabilities and your your um, your place here at the RGD. And then finally, I would say just be yourself. And I know that's super, <laughs> maybe easier said than done or, or cliche or whatever the word is, but I injected some humor. There were some funny moments that I included in my notes to share with the panelists or share with the, the reviewers rather. And I think that just bringing that lightheartedness to it, um, this is important, but it's not, it doesn't have to be so serious, I think. So injecting some humor, some lightheartedness, bringing what you do uh, and being yourself, bringing that to the table, I think goes a long way, again, to showing that you are comfortable and you're confident and you, um, you're, you're excited to be here. So that, that is that, that's my experience. And uh, hopefully that's helpful to anyone in the room who is considering um, applying. Amazing. Thank you so much, Diana. I really, I, I really like that. Uh, I was going to ask, um, oh, I can't remember what I was going to ask now. It was, that was just, that was, I think you answered my questions before I even had a chance to ask them. So that was, that was fantastic. Um, I think we're going to open it up now to, uh, to, I'll, I'll get Bianca if, um, Abdul, if I can get Bianca on, um, on the screen as well. I'll change my thing here. So I just have some questions and I'll just ask both of you. Um, I think we're, we're, we only have about 10 minutes left and I don't think we have any questions coming in, but some questions cause this, this is recorded. So maybe we'll have future educators that are looking for it. Um, why RGD? So I just wanted to know, like, how does this benefit you? How does this benefit you as, um, as educators? How did, how do you feel like it brings your, your your benefits to your students and what would you say to those educators that are out there thinking like I would because you you constantly want to make life better for your students you want to you give them as much kind of inspiration and and step out in the world it's like what would you say to them and, and why RGD I'm sorry that was a lot of questions but uh Diana go ahead <laughs> yeah so I I so for me personally RGD I think is is whatever you want to make it, you can make it. So if you just want to be a certified RGD, have that little logo stuck in your email signature, by all means, there's value there. But I think beyond that, for me, it has been a really incredible opportunity to meet others. So I became involved in the educator committee on the education committee, and I've been creating content there. And I have been, uh, I've met some really incredible people. I've presented at a couple of conferences now. So it kind of opens up the door to professional development opportunities and building a community outside of your institution's network, which I think is, is been the, the massive shift for me which is which again has opened up doors and opportunities is just to expand my design community excellent and what value does it bring value to your students as well too like and how you what you're able to bring to them of course yeah, yeah I, I absolutely think it does and even just something as simple as being aware of the student awards and uh and letting students know what is available for them uh, as being being a part of the organization. But again, it just keeps me kind of uh, current and on top of my um, at, at the top of my game because I am involved in creating new content, doing research that revolves around my work with the RGD. Excellent. Bianca? Um, for me, uh, kind of similar, um, but I'm going to say like what what I found when I was full time teaching for six years is you get so ingrained in the academia mindset of things and what the RGD did for me was it like allowed me to make those connections with people in industry that literally like it's not that I you know didn't want that it's it's literally you get so ingrained and like you know doing your your prep for your classes and like doing your like it's all of that stuff that eats up the time and RGD made space for me to connect with individuals um, I met new people that I onboarded to our advisory committee at Humber, like we did all kinds of things to get more 
tied to the industry, which I feel like is always a thing that is intentional in academia, but always a struggle, no matter how you try. It's like, you know, you have so many students, you have so many lectures to prep, you have so many assignments to mark, and it's often hard to make that space to connect. So for me, it was it was literally that that connection and like being on a committee, meeting with the committee, being involved was like it gave that opportunity for that. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, overall, like um, I know that we've kind of touched on this is like if we're if you're talking to an educator that's looking to to go through this process, um, what's a good example of how to how to find time because educators are incredibly busy human beings I'll, I'll tell you that you guys have a lot on your plate like how would you how would you give someone advice to squirrel away five minutes to um to get it done because i think the whole process educator or practitioner um is trying to find that five minutes is trying to find the time and it, it's it's a daunting task that uh, is ahead of you how as educators how would you suggest to find time for this i have some thoughts i have three thoughts Okay. Thought number one is if you really want to do it, you'll find the time. There's, there's, you'll, you'll do it. You'll, you'll find the time, whether that's in the summer, whether that's over the Christmas break, whether that's over reading week, squirreling away a bit of time is, is you just have to kind of protect that time. But what I will say is if you're strategic about it, I don't think it has to take you that long to pull together. Most of us have to do a currency report at the end of the year to say these are the professional activities. These are the, the things that we have done to keep ourselves current in industry this year. And that is submitted to the university's administration. That is a, a starting point. That probably has a couple of projects right there that you can pull from and start to build on. Um, the third thing I was going to say is after you do, let's say, a really successful project in your course. So one of the examples in my one of the case studies was something that I, um, yeah, just in my advanced typography class, we the students created their own typeface. So that is something and there were really incredible results. So I would say I was excited about that project student work was exciting things were happy. Take an hour. Translate that excitement onto onto the page so do it in the moment. So I think mm -hmm. that that's helpful as well. It doesn't feel like an extra burden. It's just you're already excited about it. Why not capture it? That's a that's great advice. That's fantastic advice. Bianca? I feel like you stole my answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, number one was like crucial. Like you just need to like any like they say anything in life, if it's important, you'll find the time. That's at the end of the day. So, um, and uh, other things too is like, yes, when it's in the moment, translate it to something that you could possibly formulate into a case study. I think as educators, we are so like, we are just, we are moving so fast to update to, you know, like we have to update as the industry updates. So we actually have a lot of content at our fingertips. Like it just mm -hmm. takes some time to actually go through it. Um, and I realize that, you know, all the time when I'm like going through my files and it's just about picking something that, you know, resonated with you, like really deep, more deeply than any other project and, you know, reflecting on it. It's not, I, sometimes I think about case studies. I'm like, oh, it's, you know, a lot of work, but really it's like, it's just, it's almost like journaling what happened. Like, you know what I mean? So it's like, I think we, we make it harder sometimes than we, than it really is. And truthfully, just got to find the time, find something that resonated with you and put, put your mind to it. Like it's really as simple as that. I think that's a really good tip at, and I think that that goes both for educators and practitioners is people make it a lot harder than it actually is. Like it, it you do have to check a bunch of boxes. I know with the educationer, educator um, and the practitioner forms are, are slightly different. Um, if you are interested, please reach out. Um, as, <laughs> as Diana said, it is a newer, newer process. Um, we'll be able to, to walk you through that, but uh, uh, finding time and it's, I think it's also important to say that you don't have to do it all at once. Yeah. Um, you can do it, you can do it, like if you have reading week and then you you don't get it through all in reading week, you can pick it up again in the summer vacation um, or on a weekend or kind of pick at it. Um, I think people think that you kind of all have to do it once and then it's like, that's it. Like it's kind of a wash after that. Um, any other final thoughts? We've got five more minutes. I just didn't know if you guys had any final thoughts on on just all the. Was it hard for you? Like, 
Like, did you enjoy the process? I think that's a good question. For me personally, I think if you're on the fence, just do it because I, I did enjoy the process. I mean, it, it was something to kind of compile these case studies, compile these projects that I had worked on and see them all in one place. And it was kind of like, oh, that's cool. I'm, <laughs> I did those things. So for me, it was, it's been valuable to go through the certification process, but also the act of doing all of the lead up to that, I found was, was valuable as well. I do want to say one other thing, um, and I think this is for, I think, I think this is applicable to anybody working in a discipline where when you're doing that discipline or, you know, you're a designer, you're an educator, you often have, you're the worst at re like reflecting on your own work. And this really forced me to go, oh, I have all this stuff. I've done all these things. I've done all these projects. It's like, it's like the electrician who has like, you know, um, extensions cords throughout the house. Like you don't, you're the worst at documenting what you do. And this actually really, the RGD application and going through that pro process really made me realize how much stuff I do, like really truthfully, because you just go through the motions and you forget about the things and you're just, you're, you're chasing the next deadline or chasing the next project. So um, that's one thing I, I really liked about it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, ladies. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. Um, it makes me miss not being a student again, um, just because I'm a lifelong learner and I think it's fantastic. So um, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Um, just uh, just some housekeeping for those uh, here. Um, we have Vancouver's Design Thinkers is coming up at the end of the month. Um, you do not have to fly all the way to Vancouver to join. It is being offered offered virtually, as in uh, and in person. I know myself. I am can't wait to fly out to be in Vancouver at the end of the month. Um, but uh, you don't have to fly out to get there. Um, you can register at designthinkers.com, um, and we'll be coming out with a new freshly certified. I have, will have to talk to Abdul about our next opening, um, but. Uh, I have, um, I would like to speak to our provisionals and for any provisionals that are out there that have transferred over into becoming full fledged RGDs and uh, just what their process was like as well too. I think that's it. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.